I need to tell you something, Chris said. Okay, but let's have another drink first. I nodded. That's why I'd come over in the first place, to drink away my sorrows. It was late fall and the sun disappeared around 5.30. The early darkness compounded my gloomy mood from a recent breakup. Chris was trying to cheer me up. We'd been hanging out more than usual with the ample free time that you get back for friends when you are no longer a we. I accepted the vodka cocktail, heavy on the vodka. We clinked glasses and I took a gulp. That was my third drink and I was feeling a little woozy, but not drunk. My tolerance level was higher then and my adrenaline was pumping. Anticipation heightened the senses the alcohol attempted to dull. I knew what Chris had to say, but I was glad for the intermission. We were both working up our courage. We listened to music, something a little too fast and unfamiliar, but played at a low volume like we were in a lounge above a nightclub where white people dance without discernible attention to rhythmic prompts. <laughs> a few minutes later, I plopped the empty glass onto a side table and Chris immediately said, I like you. I know. No, I mean, I really like you. I know. I felt emboldened by the joint we'd smoked and the vodka. She leaned forward and asked, what would happen if I tried to kiss you right now? I intentionally traced a finger over my lips. There's one way to find out. My usual sharp edges had been dulled. That was likely the plan. Chris was giving me an uptight straight girl's excuse to do something out of character. If she'd been a man, I would have been outraged by the thought of being manipulated by alcohol. But she wasn't a man, and I felt safe. Double standards are a curious thing, and I was curious. I was grateful for the plausible deniability she offered, but I'd already made up my mind to be seduced. The music changed to a new arrhythmic pulsing beat. I felt another kick of adrenaline. We kissed for a while, but it was clear that we both had questions that begged answers. I wanted a reason why my dating life sucked. Was it this obvious? She wanted to help me find out. Chris often told me how she was a magnet for straight girls. I know straight isn't the right term anymore, but this was at least 10 years ago. Times were different and these conversations were not so easy. I joked then that she was noble and selfless in not discriminating against her gay for a day suitors. She smiled, a secret kind of smile then, that foreshadowed this very moment as she slid down the couch and released my belt. I left maybe an hour or so later, driving precisely five miles below the speed limit. I feared that I was still too intoxicated for the road, but I was not fearful enough to stay and sleep it off. As you might imagine, I was actually pretty alert my brain working, classic Virgo overdrive. <laughs> what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? Am I different now? I didn't feel different. Two days later, Chris called me sometime after dark and told me to come over right now. It was direct like a command, but flirty. I hadn't yet resolved the questions swirling in my brain, but I reasoned that I was apparently now someone who had sex with women, so I should at the very least try it sober before I come to any conclusions, <laughs> right? My second experience wasn't mind-blowing or all that different from other sexual encounters, except for the extra breasts. <laughs> that was new and enjoyable. When we finished, well, when I finished, I didn't know quite how to reciprocate. I wasn't sure of the etiquette, 
So I asked if she would, you know, like me to do something to her. She laughed really hard. <laughs> A little too hard, frankly. <laughs> but she didn't bother to make any requests. We lay there awkwardly staring up at the ceiling. Her arm was around me and I was thinking about etiquette again. I wondered what might be the appropriate waiting period before leaving. I desperately wanted to sleep in my own bed. The evening had gone well, but I hadn't found the answers I'd been looking for. I took a deep breath in preparation for a, this was nice, but I think maybe we're better off as friends conversation. She took a deep breath a second before me and said, I love you. The syllable I had prepared to utter turned to ash and salted my tongue. My throat felt as dry as earth scorched by summer wildfire, and I could have sworn I tasted the bitter, smoky residue. Eventually, I closed my mouth and focused on willing my saliva glands to start working again. The ripple of her, un of her words hitting the unrequited silence reverberated like a fucking sonic boom. She didn't turn to look at me, and I didn't turn to look at her. We remained riveted by the ceiling shadows from the streetlights filtering through the blinds. My heart raced anew. My thoughts scrambled, scurried, blurred. But I remained motionless. Breathe, I remembered. Breathe. Then, three little words came to my mind. Walk. Don't run. Resisting a swift, clumsy exit took effort. I would have happily flown away, on, flown away on diaphanous wings if I could have. Instead, I sat up, turned my back on her, and swung my feet to the floor. I stepped into my underwear and pulled them up. You don't have to go, she said. I grabbed a sock and put it on. I took a step and found the other. I mean, do you think you have to go? Is that what you think you have to do, she said, not really asking, but narrating. I pulled on my jeans and picked up my bra from the floor. Say something, she said. I busied myself with a t-shirt and sweater. It was cold in the Midwest, and I'd worn layers. <laughs> she didn't move from the bed. She was still staring at the ceiling for all I knew. You know, there's nothing to be ashamed of, she said. I knew she was wrong. But I didn't try to explain why exactly. I couldn't explain. Not then. I continued to maneuver around the darkened room slowly, methodically. I found my coat, my hat, grabbed my purse. This is stupid, what you're doing, she called out as I closed the door behind me. I woke up the next morning and felt numb, bracing for the inevitable conflict. But when I looked, there was no text from Chris, no missed calls, no angry voicemails demanding an explanation or repentance, nothing, not for days, a week, weeks. I was relieved, but there was a jagged edge to it that kept snagging my thoughts. Otherwise, life continued as usual. The next time I saw Chris was a month later at a party. We had many mutual friends. I smiled and we bantered. I maybe even flirted, like before. I did not acknowledge that this was after. She blessedly played along. We were both masters of repression. <laughs> Every once in a while, though, when we were sequestered in a corner on a couch, she'd look at me and arch an eyebrow as if telepathically communicating. <laughs> Are you serious with this bullshit? You're going to erase what happened? I'd smile back, brightly, naively, 
insanely perhaps, <laughs> I had resolved to be as willfully oblivious as the only black teenager on a summer road trip in a 1980s horror film. <laughs> A nugget of wisdom from George Costanza's character on Seinfeld was guiding me. It's not a lie if you believe it. <laughs> I know, that sounds dark and stupid and very newly elected Republican member of Congress of me. <laughs> but I was already in too deep. I still couldn't explain my actions, so I folded them up into a tight ball and hid them in a dark corner of my subconscious like the dysfunctional adult that I am. This lie that I believed was not a lie continued for years. Chris met someone else, maybe a handful of months later, a great woman with a cool, inquisitive kid in middle school. It had nothing to do with me, but I felt absolved in a way. They moved in together and they would invite me to holiday parties and birthdays and I'd happily attend bearing gifts, booze, or potluck items. We were and are all to this day still friends-ish. Sometime after they broke up, Chris's ex-girlfriend and I were at lunch. I could tell there was something on her mind. During the appetizer, she said there was a question she had to ask me. I knew it was coming, but I smiled innocently. Of course, what's up? <laughs> Were you and Chris ever in a relationship? She asked, tone even, eyes searching, but not probing. There was no accusation, no judgment. I could have easily told the truth but I had been practicing the lie that was not a lie for years by now, so reflex overrode reason. I kept my tone neutral, relaxed, no protestations or over-explaining. I huffed out a quiet laugh, <laughs> good-naturedly, I hoped. I furrowed my brows in mock confusion. No, why do you ask? I don't know, she mused, just something Chris used to say. She'd refer to you as my Deborah and emphasize the word my, especially when she'd been drinking. Really? I said fake pondering the revelation. That's odd. I didn't betray myself with nervous laughter, no darting eyes or fidgeting to give me away. I shrugged. Conversation over. If she knew I was lying, she was polite enough not to redirect. We switched topics and lunch continued. I've only recently begun to reconcile the truth. The truth, part of it at least, is that I slept with Chris because I was lonely and I felt defective. I wanted someone to validate me. I'd never been with a woman before and haven't since. Part of me was curious, like I said, but part of me was opportunistic. In truth, I felt unlucky in love and I felt maybe unlovable. And that's something for which you might occasionally seek a human sacrifice. Her tactics had been dubious, but I pretended to be the easy prey that she was hunting. In reality, I set the tap, trap and she wandered in. The vampire was me, absorbing her adoration to prop up my ailing ego, feeding on her desire, sucking in her affection. She was convenient and eager. She felt safe. I didn't consider if I was safe for her. I might have bathed in her want and adulation for a while longer, soothing the parts of me that ate, if only she hadn't uttered those three damning words, spewing garlic and holy water on the illusion. 
Those three words cut through the validation buzz I'd been jonesing for. My, gra my cravings and attention lust abruptly ceased. As someone who has been propositioned with, but I've never been with someone like you before. I know the hurt that comes from insincere appreciation. I did and do love her. We'd been friends for years, but I was not a lesbian. I was an asshole. And yes, and yes, I know those two are not mutually exclusive. In the movies, vampires glamor their victims, erase thoughts, heal wounds, cast spells, and vanish. However, this form of deception eludes everyday vampires. Instead, the lack of bedazzling skills teaches us to be more conscientious. When we have our moments of craving and wanton abandon, we each learn not to bite down too hard. Deborah Bass, closing it out.